Hello and welcome for another California Geography presentation. Uh, this one will introduce the basics behind California's population and migration. There's going to be a little overlap with this presentation and the next one coming up, uh, dealing more with California's cultures and uh, population ethnicities as well. But I guess that I, I was really excited to put this one together as a presentation to really kind of create some conversation about what you might think be have been and will be some of the push and pull factors of California's population migration, people either coming in or leaving. So um, again, I introduced, I guess, you know, I, I think sometimes I spend more time on my cover photo of my presentations than I do on the presentation itself because I wanted to really speak about what I feel in some of the research that I have. Um, so I think that a lot to do with California's population uh, densities and migration deals a lot with economics and dealing with opportunity, whether it be something as simple as the introduction of the sun-kissed orange in the Santa Paula region or something maybe being a little bit for, you know, more um, technological up into uh, the Saline Valley and looking up at some of the uh, Central Valley technology and, you know, just, you know, when you think about opportunity, I think that California is really that beacon of hope for a lot of different people from not just around the world, but just from our other fellow states, is that pretty much anything can be done in California if you think about it. So um, we'll start with that. So what I did is I found this interesting graph showing California's population going back from 1900 to 2015. Obviously, there's a gap of when this is being recorded. Uh, I do have some more additional data, but I thought this was good enough to start because what I did is I found a graph. Then I added, what, 10 or 11 different things that happened in California and Los Angeles history. And then I'm just curious in conversation. Or do you think these were push or pull factors? Do you think these are reasons why a population would change? Maybe not. So um, I want to introduce some of these things. And I'll go through them. I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. But um, nonetheless, I think it's kind of fun. So we'll start off with the first one, with uh, World War I and Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood, well, why is that important? Well, uh, World War I, uh, you know, a lot of individuals of Jewish descent actually migrated to California, and most of the original Hollywood studios were introduced by immigrants of Jewish descent. Uh, the Million Dollar Theater, the, th the first theater in Los Angeles, you know, in the Hollywood region, um, was by Sid Grauman, who was of Jewish descent. And most of the movie studios, it's very interesting, you know, because they were leaving, uh, you know, obviously their home and coming here for an opportunity and to seek refuge. Uh, and they created these incredibly large business structures that obviously Hollywood continues through today. Um, so that's why I threw that on there. The, uh, the Los Angeles Aqueduct, as we discussed in other presentations, 1913. In March, when that aqueduct opened, you brought water to a community and to really a portion of the state that otherwise did not have water resources. So what does that do for a population? Well, now there's water. Now we can grow things. You know, land that at one point would have sold for next to nothing are now selling for maybe $1,000 an acre at that time. That's a lot of money difference. Um, I brought in the Great Depression of the 1930s. That was a, a pivotal point in California's population growth because people came to California. During the Great Depression, most of the agriculture was not, you know, because of the Dust Bowl, there was not a lot of agriculture or opportunity in the Midwest. But everyone knew that there was plenty of water, lots of resources and reasons to move to California. They had put up marketing really fantastic marketing around the world saying come to California we've got resources we've got this ability uh, and jobs available and that brought a tremendous amount of people into the California region um, I mean we won't even talk about music I mean think about the people that came from the Midwest and brought that music and then now you have you know moving forward in that time the Bakersfield sound you know from all those people that came you know the Okies from Muskogee that came out this way uh, and changing really uh, music as we knew it today. Here we have uh, World War II, uh, where that ends. Look at the boom of a population coming into California. Um, I threw this on here as well, uh, because think about what other things happened in California at that time. California was one of uh, many states that had Japanese internment camps. And individuals, after the camps had closed, they were given 20-something dollars and a train ticket to anywhere they wanted other than 
California. It could not be a coastal state. And that changed, those were push factors for a lot of the Japanese Americans that lived here. And that actually, if you think about the diversity change, uh, that really changed for a lot of different states. It brought in Japanese individuals and of Japanese descent, Japanese Americans, most of them were American citizens, moved into states that had really never seen anyone from Japan uh, other than on TV. Uh, you know, places like, you know, Michigan and Iowa and, and states like that. Uh, the Korean War uh, ends in the 1950s. I also introduced the birth of rock and roll in 1955. Uh, so, you know, between 1925 and 1955, were, those were considered the swinging years. Uh, the birth of rock and roll uh, 1955 began. Uh, while well, you know, rock and roll didn't necessarily originate in California, but uh, there were some sounds that did, that echoed the rock and roll movement, including the surf sound uh, that introduced out of, uh, you know, the, well, most of it came out of the Torrance area with the Beach Boys, but looking at Jan and Dean and seeing all the, you know, the beach movies that introduced in the late 50s. I also threw in here the Buzz and Woody era. A lot of us in cultural geography introduced that zone. Uh, Buzz and Woody making reference to uh, Pixar's uh, Toy Story. But think about what happened in the 1950s. You had the introduction of either the B-Western TV series, you know, all those cowboy shows, or things were transitioning into space age. We saw that these, this, this, um, this uh, movement was found in vehicles, architecture. I mean, we had all kinds of different facades that were being designed. Uh, I mean, one of the first Buzz architectural designs is the historic icon of LAX, which opened up in, uh, I think it was 1959, 1960. Uh, think about some of the restaurants that were very popular in the 1950s and going forward. Look at Clearman's, Backwood Inn. You know, we see those uh, big log cabins with the snow on the roof. That's reminiscent of, of the American West. You know, people, people believed that California was the last of that American West. And so it's just really interesting to think about how television and car designs, building designs, you know, how things began to change. Here we have 19, you know, early 1960s, I think it was 61 or 62, uh, the introduction of Barbie and you know, the Mattel factory in Southern California. Fast forward into the 1984 Olympics, uh, Desert Storm ends, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. So, you know, is there a correlation? You know, when I throw in, uh, you know, the introduction of uh, Buzz and Woody era, birth and rock and roll, we can see that there's been a jump of population. I mean, did rock and roll bring people to California? Um, I mean, I think that's a fair question to ask because does it? You know, does liberation give people an opportunity to come and travel? I mean, one of the first safe regions uh, based on sexuality was San Francisco. You know, they were one of the first to have a safe space for people who identified as gay and, uh, they saw population densities increase dramatically because it was known to be an area that was welcoming of people. Um, and so when you start seeing things along those lines, does that really make a difference? Does everyone coming back after World War II make a change in population? Well, sure, you got the baby boomers. What about what happened after 9-11? Were there babies born after 9-11? And the answer is, yeah, there were a lot. You know, we see that there are relationships with these big events that occurred in California. Maybe you can think of some that, I mean, I just put a couple on here. I mean, are there others? Absolutely. I mean, I, we missed something that happened here in the 70s and early 80s. I mean, what happened there other than the death of disco? You know, what happened in California then? You know, what happened with different agriculture rates? What happened before then? You know, that's a great question. Well, let's talk about before then. Looking at California's indigenous people. So native people have lived in California for over 10,000 years. Uh, before the Spanish invasion of 1542, there were over, they believe, between 350 to 700,000 indigenous people in California. Obviously, we don't have appropriate records because they don't have it. They, there wasn't a system like we have now with social security numbers and birth and death certificates. Uh, but they believe that there could have been upward of 700,000 indigenous people in California at that time. Now, due to disease and violence and things along those lines, you know, they know that the population was reduced to 25,000 uh, because most of those people were in captivity. 
Now, California alone at that time had six linguistic groups and 85 different languages spoken in California just as little as 200 years ago. I mean, you think about, you know, what is, you know, California is one of the very few places that does not have a state language. You know, English is not the formal language of California. We don't have a formal language of California. English is the formal business language, but not for our state. So think about that we had over 85 different languages in California when the indigenous people were the majority of the state. And I think that's pretty uh, pretty cool. Here's some photos I found uh, of, uh, of that, of California in particular. I got most of these from the Museum of Natural History. Um, again, if California indigenous people interest you, we have classes on it. You know, we have classes called California Indians, and it takes you through you know, the 10,000 year mark all the way up to what's happening today and everything in between. Now, since I mentioned languages, I thought this was interesting. So here we have uh, our six root languages and then all of the different tribes that spoke within those. Obviously, there were different languages within them. So here we are uh, here, uh, Los Angeles in the Gabrielino and the Chumash zone. Uh, most of us in Santa Clarita dealt most of the Tatavium group, which is right here. Uh, Tatavium was a Chumash uh, rendition, a group of people. Uh, there were the Alikliks that lived in Castaic Lake, which were known as the Stutterers, um, all kinds of different languages. But I thought this map was interesting because it shows all of these uh, dominant uh, tribes that were at one point speaking languages in California. But then I also introduced California's counties, a map that you've seen before. And I guess I always thought that was interesting because there's definitely a correlation with our county boundaries going back into the boundaries in which some of the indigenous people had lived. And if you think about it, look at some of the names. Perhaps some of these names of these uh, groups of people correlate with the county in which they live in, or maybe even the region. I mean, here you have the Mojave uh, group. Well, this you know, most of the San Bernardino and most of the Nino, this is all part of the Mojave Desert. Uh, looking at the Yokuts, uh, the uh, Selenian, the uh, um, and the Pat winds, just moving through all these different uh, locations, the Pomo. But anyway, I just thought this was an interesting map. You know, as geographers, we look at this and see if there's correlations looking at, well, okay, so we've got different regions, Santa Barbara area, part of Ventura, the Los Angeles, the Gavrilino, which is a name that we give to a lot of, you know, the original Los Angeles individuals. And then here we are in Santa Clarita up in this zone here, which I thought was kind of interesting, which is northern Los Angeles border of... Uh, Ventura County. So moving on to the next slide, uh, looking at the El Camino Real. Uh, you might have recognized this on part of the one freeway. They've got the signs with the little mission bell on the lamppost. So uh, Father Universiara uh, began in San Diego really to take control of the state. Um, he did not live to foresee all missions being built, but he saw most of them. The last mission was erected in 1823. So each mission population varied between 500 to 4,000 people, and in about 1822, after Mexican independence, the mission system became obsolete. At that point, Spain transferred California to Mexico. So here's the couple things to talk about. First is the San Fernando mission down here in the bottom. Here's a photo of that in 1885. Not that far from us, but what's actually interesting about the San Fernando mission is all the mission systems were bo broken up in parties of three. You, know, you had the Pueblo, the Presidio, and then the Mission. The Pueblo is where most of your people lived. The Presidio was going to be more of your militia, and then the Mission was more of the church and the agriculture zone. So the Mission in, in San Fernando was the, the chapel and the church. Now, the uh, Presidio was actually located in San, Santa Clarita. Uh, the new uh, structures that are going up uh, along the 126 behind Magic Mountain. That was actually the location of the original Presidio of the San Fernando Mission. There's actually a, a sign there on the old road uh, plaque that explains uh, that that region there. But um, here's the missions. What's interesting about the missions, uh, you know, when going back to fourth grade, learning that they're one day's journey apart, well, they, they're just about that, but that's not why they're where they are. Uh, there were a lot of reasons as to the locations in which they were built, but the biggest one is because, one, there was already people there, the indigenous people, and second is that there would be water. So that was the easiest thing. Uh, you say, oh, well, there's already water here, and there's people, so this would be a perfect place. So didn't, they, they didn't necessarily go out there with their maps and go, well, this is exactly one day's journey. Um, now, what's interesting about the mission system, uh, not to glorify it by any means, is that... Uh, 
you know, there's been a lot of con you know conversation and controversy as to how do you get indigenous people to not only give up their language, give up their rights, and give up their home, uh, and begin to you know work along the missions. And so there's been a lot of discussion about what type of violence was involved, um, how do you force people. Uh, there was a professor at Cal State Northridge who. Um, studied a lot of this and he actually came up with a really interesting reason as to how you how this mission system became so successful at its prime was that it really didn't have to be done by force the economy of indigenous people in California was actually a bead system uh, they would sit and they would carve beads out of different precious stones and then be able to trade them as a form of currency and uh, there's uh, some speculation in that uh, especially when dealing with Catholicism that uh, you know, rosary beads. Beads are a, a symbol of faith and, and things like that. And um, so it was almost assumed that could you bribe people with money, uh, in that sense, like, well, if you come here, we don't speak a language, but I've got beads, you know. And then there was a study that he went through, going, well, if you uh, inflate their economy essentially by introducing tremendous amounts of beads, then your economy has no. No value. Your money has no value, uh, and so then it gets to a point that you have doesn't matter how many beads you have, they're not worth anything. So you can't trade them for anything to survive, and now you really have no choice but to become involved in the mission system because you can't afford to eat, you can't afford to pay for it because your beads at one point were worth a lot, and now they're not worth anything. Um, and so there's this very interesting, you know, if you think about just like today's population, like does that you know, does money buy? Uh, faith does money buy people to do things, and uh, you know that's that's a whole other conversation to have. But uh, yeah, the El Camino Real. Uh, well, what happens right after this? You know, well, Mexico owns uh, California, and then at some point, the United States uh, then will actually sell it to the United States, Mexico, and then. What happens? About a year after we the contract is signed, because at that point you know, they realize there's no money and there's no gold in California. They can't find it. Just about a year after the contract was signed, gold was found. Convenient, right? Uh, so I found this great map. This is what, how, what brought people to California. Well, gold. Um, although by the time most of the people got there, the big pieces were gone anyway. But Nonetheless, the gold rush. So here we can see different ways. You've got the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, the route by Jedediah Smith, and then you also have the infamous Donner Party. Uh, so you've got all these different people that came in through here. Um, if you notice throughout this journey, and uh, this is the main routes of 1853. Obviously, it was in 19, uh, 1849 in which the gold rush began. Uh, look where they all came from. You know, They came from these very large regions in which people had been living in. Most of this had been, as you can see, it's labeled as territories because there weren't very well-defined uh, borders or understanding of what was even out there. And people headed west and came into different parts of California uh, looking for gold. Now, we know about, you know, Sutter's Mill and all that stuff, but actually gold was found in Santa Clarita at the uh, the Oak of the Golden Dream. An individual sat down giving up, not finding, you know, he was looking for other oils and stuff, but he sat down and grabbed a bunch of wild onions and went to go chomp on them, and on, attached to the root of the onion was one of the largest gold nuggets found in Southern California. So is there gold in them, there hills down here? And the answer is actually there is, but it's just not as much as they were hoping. So here's the trails west and bringing people from all the way across. Now this isn't the only place that people came from, but this is the begin the main trails that people literally walked uh, to get to California. So which brings us to this little video. Uh, I'm actually going to watch it with you because I think it's you know, since it's going to be uh, including what we're going to be discussing. But this is a short video I found on the California Gold Rush. So let's get that going. The California Gold Rush. Gold was first discovered in California by James W. Marshall at Sutter's Mill near the city of Coloma, California. The story goes back to 1848. James was building a sawmill for John Sutter when he saw something shining in the river. They both tested the metal. It was gold. Soon, the word got out. It was no longer a secret. Not many Americans lived in California, but that soon changed. 
By 1849, thousands upon thousands of people arrived in search of gold. The journey to California was dangerous. Some would go by sea from the East Coast or on land along the California Trail. These people would become known as the 49ers. One way to find gold was to pan for it. Miners would sink the pan into the water and shake the dirt away to reveal any gold. Miners needed a lot of equipment, including a mining pan, a shovel, a pick, and food supplies. Businesses who sold this equipment to the miners often became richer than the miners could ever be themselves. Wherever gold or silver was discovered, miners would move in and set up camp. These would often grow into boom towns, which would become deserted once all the gold opportunities had dried up. So, was the gold rush worth it? Some became wealthy, but most returned home empty-handed. So was it worth it? Well, I brought a lot of people out here, and a lot of people either went home or they couldn't afford to go home. But who came out? Well, that's why I wanted to introduce this little video here. This uh, slide, excuse me. So the 49ers, so January 24th, uh, 1848 is when they found gold. Then by in 1850, California became the 31st state just a little over one year after the Treaty of Guadalupe. Um, moving forward, 300,000 people came into California from around the globe in search of gold. Uh, and 300,000 people moved to California by foot or by boat in less than 10 years. So who came? Well, we obviously have European. We had groups of people from Mexico, people from Africa, uh, individuals from China. And then actually a lot of women came. And these people, many of them were already American. So they were already European-American, Mexican-American, African-American. Um, and many of them were not. Uh, we also have to remember at this time that a lot of these people came on their own will or uh, they were brought with, uh, because in some areas, uh, obviously, slavery was still um, legal. So some of these people were actually brought, you know, as slaves to work in California. Uh, but I found a photo of just about every group of people that came out to California. Here's an interesting sign I found for California Direct uh, Steamship from Nicaragua. You know, so people coming into California. This was a huge, huge deal. And this really began to intensify the diversity of California. Uh, well, what else did? There were lots of events that intensified the diversity of California. Um, let's talk about some of the Los Angeles, in particular, how we developed culture. I mean, 1879, we had the Los Angeles Symphony. 1880, we have the University of Southern California. 1882, the state normal school at Los Angeles, which would later turn into UCLA. The Occidental College in Pomona, Caltech. Uh, we have the Great Earthquake in 1906. Uh, we have the 1911 Women's Rights in California, 1937 the Golden Gate Bridge, 1942 the internment camps, 1940 the 1950s. I think this is something worth talking about. We'll spend more time later talking, though. The Chavez Ravine, which had three, it was, it was technically three Mexican-American communities in the Chavez Ravine. Most of the individuals who were identified as Mexican-American uh, had been pushed around and moved around uh, due specifically to housing discrimination because people could say, well, you don't look like you should live in this neighborhood, so we're not going to let you live here. So they created this community identified as the Chavez Ravine, which unfortunately, they would be all pushed out by bulldozer to make way for the Dodger Stadium. 1955, Disneyland. 1960, the, the inventing of skateboarding, uh, the, or otherwise known as sidewalk surfing, coming out of Venice, California. I threw in College of the Canyons in 1969, 1972, Magic Mountain, and then uh, 1981, Fernando Valenzuela uh, joins the Dodgers, and that is a huge impact. I mean, talking about, I mean, going back earlier, you can talk about, um, you know, the diversity of baseball, but that was a really, really big deal for the Los Angeles Dodgers, and that really changed a lot of the culture, you know, uh, and so when you think, are these all the things? Absolutely not. I just picked a handful of things that I thought were interesting that we could talk about, but um, are there other things that can help develop the culture and help reflect the diversity of California? And the answer is, oh, absolutely. Uh, so let's take a step back and look at one of the, you know, the origin of Los Angeles. 
here we are, the birth of Los Angeles in 1868. This is Alvera Street, as you know it today, in downtown Los Angeles. What's interesting about this, and we'll talk a, bit, a little bit later in a different presentation, is, well, you know, the location of uh, the plaza, the location of, of, and the people who have changed. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I think most people assume when you think about Alvera Street is that it's pretty much a, uh, you know, it's an early Mexican-American and Mexican culture uh, region, but the reality is it's actually was a pretty big mix between that and individuals that were Italian, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was mostly Italian and Mexican-American individuals, um, and that's not necessarily something people think about. And also Chinatown, which would have been located across the street, which would then be moved twice. That's another conversation to be had. So really the beginning of our cities. All right, so we talked a little bit about uh, the people who come in, some of the big events. I found this is from 2012. Dated, yes, but interesting, I think so. So what they're doing is they can see California is this here showing where do, pe where do people go? Are people leaving California? So we can see that some people are leaving California and a group are going to Texas. We see a lot of people going to Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Colorado. Uh, who's coming in? We can see that all these Midwestern states and moving over here, a large group from New York is either coming into Florida or to California. I think I said this was really interesting to see, well, where do people move? And I think the big question is, why? Why do people leave California? We've talked about this in class. Do people want to leave California? Some people don't. People want to come here. But then they realize they can't afford it here. Or people who are here realize they don't want to live here because they, if they, there's no... It's not affordable to live in California. I mean, for what you can buy for a house for $300,000 in California, anywhere in California, you can buy pretty much a ranch with cabins and houses and all kinds of stuff out in the Midwest. You know, the cost of living is incredibly different. So what I did is I found this here, and I thought this was interesting. This is going from 2010 to 2018. How did things change? So we can see that departures are identified as this brown color. Arrivals are green. So we can see that we're really actually seeing a, a decline in people moving into California, and we're seeing that more and more people are actually leaving California. So here's a question. Why? You know, I think that a lot, I think, that a lot of reason why is uh, people, it's cost of living. Uh, they know that they can get a lot more for a lot less. I think a lot of people are leaving the state uh, for out-of-state uh, education and then realizing they can't afford to come back. I think a lot of this has to do with the baby boomers retiring and you know people leaving California to avoid the taxes on their retirement checks. So you know you, when you retire, you'll get your money that you put into your retirement accounts, but the California the state tax is really high on that type of stuff, but other states don't tax it like that. So a lot of people are, you know, they work for a higher wage in California, and then they retire, and they move out of state, Florida, Arizona, places like that, Montana, Wyoming, and they get to keep more of their money, and their money goes a lot farther. Uh, so I think that's a very interesting piece. And then knowing that the decline of people moving into California is uh, so low, but what about when looking at illegal immigration or or individuals that are undocumented? You know, the, obviously this number doesn't pertain to this. It's looking at people who are literally moving uh, residences. But you know, are we are we going to see a decline in that as well? If you don't have as many people in the state, you don't have to feed as many people, so you're not going to need as many people working. And so this really does. It's a big cyclical event that can be quite uh, traumatic if you think about it for an economy. I think an example of this would be parts of China when they start seeing that they have an older economy, they have an older system in which people are leaving the villages to go get an education and to work in the, you know, the manufacturing industries, and they're not going back home. And so these older communities are starting to, to shrivel up in that sense, that they don't have the support of the, you know, the, the manpower to maintain these communities, and the big cities are what are thriving, and the smaller towns are kind of you know they're slowly becoming deceased in that sense. Maybe think about like Route 66 and stuff like that. What happened to those smaller towns? So I, th I saw this um, this animation online, and I thought this would be a great place to end this this talk this topic. Where were Californians born? So people who live in California, 
where did they come from? So this is 1920. So you can see that a majority of them, which is identified in green here in California, were born in California up in the 1920s. We can see that, that a lot of people are coming out of Illinois, a lot of from UK and Ireland, Missouri, New York, Ohio, Italy, Iowa, Mexico, Pennsylvania. So if you notice there's a pattern. Uh, the blue are states and the yellow are other countries. So let's see what happens to California's population over several decades. So you notice as we progress through time, population continues to increase. But where are these people coming from? Obviously, a lot of people are still coming from California. But now we bring Texas up. Notice how low Mexico is bouncing. Now it's coming back up to the 1950s. Texas is a big one. Illinois, Oklahoma is now swapping with New York. I feel like this is a, a sports game. Now notice the 1970s, Mexico is throwing all the way up to the top. The Philippines have not come out of nowhere, and they're working their way up. So is China and Taiwan, Vietnam. Uh, looking past that, we start to see that as uh, Mexico increases with their population, the Philippines, China, Taiwan, New York, Texas, Vietnam is coming up there in 2015. Notice the Philippines start to drop down. Oh, didn't even notice Guatemala there on the far left. So here we are. Where are Californians who live in California? Where were they born? A majority live in California, and were born in California. But here we have Mexico, China, Taiwan, Philippines, India, Pakistan, New York, Vietnam. So we talk about the melting pot. We've got just about everything identified on here. And I think that's really, really incredible when you think about just populations and densities and, and diversity. The main question is, what brings these people here? I think that there could be a strong argument when looking at uh, the 70s and 80s as to why Vietnam peaked up, because many of them were what you know, I have friends that were identified as the boat children, that these were people who escaped from Vietnam, and uh, they came on boats and came here as refugees, and then uh, they've grown up here. Uh, thinking about other places, India, Pakistan, was the jobs, the Philippines. Um, I mean, again, a lot of conversation can be had about different cultures, uh, you know, and I know that sometimes it can be uncomfortable, but think about these cultures in particular and what markets do they predominantly work in? Um, what essential businesses do they work in? Thinking about people who come from Mexico. Think about people who come from the Philippines. A lot of people who come from the Philippines work in the nursing fields. Uh, not like the field, like the agriculture, but the nursing occupation. Uh, looking with uh, elderly uh, caretakers in that sense, working in hospitals as nurses, doctors, um, looking at people from India and Pakistan, that as well, uh, businesses, uh, looking at people from China and Taiwan, small business and trade. So I don't know, I think it's very interesting when you think about the bigger picture, where these people come from, why they're coming here, why going again, if I hit play again, think about these eras and what's happening, 1920s, where, why are these people coming in? 30s in particular. Look at how all the states of the U.S. move up. It's because there's no jobs in the states because of the Great Depression. And that's why you have less people coming from other places. And then you get into the baby boomers. And then you move into the 60s movement. And then, yeah, I guess, I don't know. You, you could talk for hours on this. But I just thought this was kind of something interesting to throw at you. So again, California's population migration. Ups and downs. Lots of reasons why. No definitive answers, really. Lots of options and lots of reasons and opportunities of these push and pull factors. So the next video that we'll introduce is we'll talk more about the ethnic groups, where they originated from, where they're living, and the regions and the zones in which they created. You know, we you know we don't just have you know Los Angeles. We don't just have California. We have regions that have been identified as Little Armenia. We have Little Italy. We have a Little Germany. A little Pakistan, a little Persia. We have these little congregations of these individuals, a Korea town, Chinatown, right? So it becomes really interesting to think, well, why are these people coming to these areas? What what was the reason? How, what's the diversity, the ethnic groups? Um, what push and pull factors? So it's really, really uh, complex. But nonetheless, I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll talk soon.